Good evening, everyone, and welcome to our program this evening. In the studio joining me today is Representative Adam Schiff, who, uh, along with the city of Glendale, also represents the city of Burbank, Little Armenia, and has the largest Armenian-American constituency in Congress. Representative Schiff, welcome back to our studios. It's Thank always you. good to... Great to be with you. And Happy New Year. To you, too. Uh, uh, Congressman Schiff, I want to start out with uh, something that happened a couple of days ago. There was another incident on the Nagorno-Karabakh-Azerbaijan border where an Armenian soldier uh, was killed. Actually, he was trying to repel a two-pronged attack by Azeri forces and uh, was shot and killed, uh, saving several lives of his comrades as well as other civilians. Uh, when is this going to stop? Well, that's a very good question, and it's unfortunately one in a series of provocative uh, and murderous acts along the line of control, uh, which, if not explicitly sanctioned by uh, Aliyev's administration, uh, are certainly supported implicitly, and this is the real problem. Um, there was recently a meeting of the foreign ministers of Armenia and Azerbaijan to discuss Nagorno-Karabakh. Uh, the Azeri foreign minister uh, expressed support for a peaceful, peaceful negotiated resolution. But you can't say that uh, if you're condoning and permitting the kind of uh, murder and violence along the line of control that they are. When you uh, make uh, a hero out of an axe murder like Safarov, uh, you are sending a message to your troops that the murder of Armenians, the murder of, of citizens of Karabakh is not only acceptable but laudable. Um, if they're serious about a peaceful resolution, they have to prepare their people for peace, uh, and they're not doing it at all. And, uh, and if they're going to be this uh, malevolent an actor, um, you know, the, the international community really has to speak out strongly. I think we have to stop supporting them and drive home the message that uh, this kind of uh, dangerous, provocative, uh, uh, and fatal conduct is just not uh, going to persist. Mm -hmm. And this is coming uh, two or three days before another meeting before between the uh, foreign ministers, which is scheduled for Friday. Um, one thing that is always concerning, and this time around it came from uh, the U.S. Minsk Group co-chairman James Warlick, there is this uh, forced parity that in statements that are being made, all of a sudden it's the two sides that need to watch their uh, you know, manner, as, as it were. Uh, do you think, since there is failure on the international leadership to do the proper condemnation, should Congress uh, basically withdraw a U.S. military aid to Azerbaijan? Uh, well, I think we certainly should, and, and I urge that we do that exactly that last year um, for many reasons. One, for the reason you mentioned, which is they're not acting responsibly, they're acting violently. Um, but uh, two, they don't need the money. Uh, they're awash in petroleum resources. Why on earth uh, do we feel the need to provide them with any kind of military or economic support, uh, particularly when there are a lot of uh, dire uh, unmet needs here at home? So I don't think it makes any sense, and, uh, and it sends a conflicting message, you know, both in continued support, uh, but also uh, in statements like you're alluding to where uh, people want to have this false equivalence uh, and, and say, well, you know, both sides need to do this and both sides need to do that out of a desire not to offend, but the effect of which is if one side is a bad actor, then they feel there's no discouragement from continued uh, uh, bad conduct because um, all it's going to be greeted with is kind of a benign and different response, well, everybody's to blame. Um, I, I think that, you know, we need to speak out in very plain, simple, clear terms uh, about the Azeri aggression. Um, I still think we need to call for justice uh, in the case of Safarov. Um, and, uh, and we need to let the regime know that we're not going to tolerate this, we're not going to accept this, it's not going to be business as usual. Yeah, and uh, of course our hearts go out to the family of the soldiers. Last year we closed out uh, on an interesting piece that 
uh, a rug became a focal point of a tug of war, I guess, between the Armenian community and the White House. And of course, you have been one of the vocal uh, uh, supporters of having that rug displayed. Can you give us a little bit of background on that and what we should look forward to? Uh, absolutely. Uh, the rug was, uh, as you know, was made by orphans of the genocide. Uh, it was a gift to then President Coolidge as a thank you to the relief efforts that came from this country. Um, it's in the White House possession. It's been the White House possession since it was given in 1923. Uh, it has seldom been uh, displayed, and there was an event planned at the Smithsonian where it was to be displayed. Uh, Smithsonian, uh, or the White House, abruptly changed course and uh, declined to allow the rug to be displayed, saying that it wasn't an appropriate event uh, for the display of the rug because it was in connection with a, a book release. Um, so uh, I've now begun organizing an event on the Hill where we will uh, highlight the efforts of the relief organizations uh, during and after the genocide. Uh, I've written to the White House to say I want to display this as a part of that. Uh, it won't be in connection with the book uh, publication. Mm -hmm. And we are in constant touch with the White House on this, uh, trying to get a yes answer from the curator. Uh, and we're going to continue pressing on this. And, um, and I intend to go forward with or without the cooperation. Uh, there is a sister rug in Massachusetts, mm -hmm. which we hope to uh, exhibit if they uh, remain steadfast uh, in their obstructionism. But I hope that won't be the case. Uh, they did finally, you know, after a lot of pressure, uh, release a statement when they had the earlier declination to say mm -hmm. that, well, this wasn't an appropriate event. Well, if it wasn't, then tell us what an appropriate ad event is, and we will structure it that way. Uh, but uh, to me, it's, it just adds insult to injury uh, from an administration that has not uh, spoken plainly on the genocide that they would make it difficult for us uh, to display one of the more tangible um, historic artifacts of that genocide. Uh, which also brings up another issue that this rug, which is technically the property of the United States and the people of the United States, if it's being, um, you know, I'm sensing that it might be, is being used as a political pawn in this genocide issue, what do we have to look forward to as 2015 is right around the corner? Well, that's a good question. I mean, if it's, if it's even an issue or tough for them to release a rug, uh, you know, what does that say about their willingness to uh, step up to the plate? Um, it's discouraging, but we cannot allow ourselves to be deterred. And I think we have the next 14 months uh, leading up to the 100th anniversary uh, to apply maximum pressure on the administration and on the Congress uh, to recognize the genocide. I still uh, hope that this president who spoke so articulately as a senator about genocide and as a candidate for president will do so in the Oval Office. Um, and I think our best opportunity will be that 100th anniversary. Mm -hmm. In the meantime, what is uh, going on with the uh, genocide resolution that was introduced last year by you? Uh, what's going on with that? How is it um, You know, we continue to gather co-sponsors. We, I think, have about uh, almost 50 co-sponsors. Um, we don't have a green light from the House majority to take it up either in committee or on the floor. So until that changes, we're, you know, at a bit of a log jam. Um, but uh, I think we need to use this uh, time to, to organize, to develop support, uh, you know, to set our sights probably more realistically on the 100th anniversary than the 99th. Um, that's not going to mean we don't try to put pressure on the president to say the right mm -hmm. thing uh, in April. But, uh, uh, you know, we ought to all feel a sense of urgency around this centennial. Uh, and more significantly, in my view, um, in light of the fact that there are still only a few survivors left, uh, and we ought to make every effort to recognize the genocide while they're still with us. We're going to come back with Representative Adam Schiff after a brief break. Welcome back, everyone. If you are just joining us, my guest in the studio this evening is Congressman Adam Schiff. Welcome back, Congressman Thank Schiff. You. Uh, I want to shift a little bit and talk about uh, some local uh, issues. Uh, just last week or a couple of weeks ago, uh, you were in the White House with President Obama announcing the Promise Zone, which your district and Little Armenia uh, falls into. What is the Promise Zone program? Uh, this is very exciting for our, our region and in particular those areas of Little Armenia and Hollywood. 
Uh, because what it means is in the, in the four promise zones that the President announced uh, that uh, any federal grant applications uh, that uh, involve uh, young people, at-risk youth, education, health care, uh, exercise, open space, uh, social services, uh, that those grant applications move to the top of the list uh, in terms of federal government grants. Um, those promise zones are areas where there are strong stakeholder organizations who are committed to working with each other to try to improve the quality of life there, to improve uh, opportunities for success among people growing up there. Uh, so it's a very exciting thing in an area where there's a lot of poverty. Uh, people don't associate poverty with Hollywood, but there are a lot of very poor areas of Hollywood. Uh, and uh, these resources, this new priority, will be a wonderful thing. There was a lot of competition for the Promise Zones, um, and we are very fortunate that uh, this part of uh, our community got picked. And how did that picking process uh, happen? Were you directly involved in uh, asking the White House to include your district? Uh, I was, um, but I think you know more significant than my weighing in certainly was were the groups uh, themselves that uh, support this collaborative effort uh, that really put together kind of an action plan for what they would do if they got this designation. Um, and uh, they did a marvelous job. I was proud to support their work and delighted when the president uh, made his selections. We were keeping our fingers crossed. Uh, this will also be beneficial to a, another high priority of mine in that same area, which is the Hollywood Central Park. Mm -hmm. uh, this is a proposal to cap the Hollywood freeway with a park, uh, connecting two sections of Hollywood that have been divided by that freeway for decades now. Um, it will be a tremendous uh, new green space in one of the most park poor parts of Los Angeles. Uh, and we'll have our own Central Park, much like New York. Um, it will be transformative. It will be something that uh, Los Angelinos can be proud of for generations. Uh, and we have a chance to be the one to make that happen. Imagine uh, you know, if we were part of the generation to make that happen in mm -hmm. New York and elsewhere. Uh, this is Los Angeles's opportunity. That's great. And uh, what about uh, in your statements earlier, you also mentioned that this opens up opportunities for employment growth and community involvement. How does that uh, fit in and how can it be applicable to, let's say, the little Armenia community? Well, and that's a very good point because, you know, it, it still remains the preeminent challenge uh, for most families, uh, the economics, trying to stay, work, uh, stay at work and uh, hold down uh, sometimes multiple jobs. Um, this will help in terms of everything from uh, potentially from job training to the creation of jobs. Uh, for example, if that park goes forward because it is uh, advantaged uh, as part of the promised uh, zone, now you got me almost saying promised land, um, <laughs> then there will be many thousands of jobs in the, in the building of that park and the infrastructure to uh, cap that freeway. Uh, so it could be a great economic uh, boost for the area as well. Mm -hmm. Certainly when we reported uh, this news, uh, especially on our social media platforms, it just uh, uh, exploded. So there is a lot of interest in the community. What can the community to do to get engaged in this uh, program? Well, you know, there are many organizations that uh, provide vital services in the area um, that are really struggling. The uh, Armenian Relief Society does a fabulous job, uh, but like many other nonprofit organizations, uh, took a real toll during the recession, both because uh, charitable giving falls off during recession and the need for the service goes up exponentially. It's kind of a perfect mm -hmm. storm. Um, now when ARS and other like organizations apply for federal grants to provide those services, uh, those grant applications will move to the top of the mm -hmm. stack. No guarantee they're going to be approved yeah. and they're still going to have to make the case uh, for uh, the fact they can be effective and cost effective and they've got ch good accountability and checks and balances. But uh, everything else being equal compared to other applications from other parts of the state and country, they're going to prevail. Uh, mm -hmm. So um, that's great news uh, for an area that's really desperately in need of those services. Mm -hmm. You highlighted uh, youth programs. Uh, what do you envision those being as far as uh, helping out the community? You know, it, it will really depend on what the, the stakeholders in the community uh, feel is the highest priority, but uh, it can be everything from after school tutoring uh, to um, athletic opportunities to being able to hike in the Angeles Forest. Uh, outward bound kind of programs. I mean, there's no um, end to the list of what can be accessible. It, it could mean improved mental health uh, services. 
uh, for those youth or for the parents of those youth, if that's the need, or uh, substance abuse uh, counseling um, or uh, uh, accelerated achievement programs, uh, trips to the Jet Propulsion Laboratory, new educational opportunities, early childhood education. Mm -hmm. Um, some of the most effective dollars we spend in education are early childhood yeah. education, uh, prenatal care. Um, essentially what they want, what the, the president wants these promise owners to do is look at, you know, essentially starting with pregnancy, uh, you know, all through a childhood, um, do everything we can uh, in a really collaborative, cohesive, wraparound way to make sure that those kids uh, have every opportunity to succeed. and. Uh, and the same opportunities as others, and uh, and this ought to help make that possible. Mm -hmm. And another issue that has been um, big in the headlines and high priority, uh, what has the district enrollment been in the Affordable Care Act uh, uh, programs that are offered both within the state and nationally? Well, the, the good news is that, that the enrollment in California, and I think our district is representative, uh, has been pretty solid. We're one of the most successful states in terms of a health insurance exchange. Uh, we had some problems, not as many as the federal mm -hmm. uh, website. We had our own challenges. Uh, one of the more significant ones was a decision that covered California, the state exchange made, that uh, people who had ex uh, policies that went well into this year uh, were going to have those policies terminated uh, prior to the end of their terms. Now, I think that was a mistake, but that's the judgment that the Covered California made. Uh, they made that because uh, they were concerned that if they allowed those policies to continue, uh, people who were healthier, who had the less expensive policies, would keep those. Uh, people who were sicker would go into the exchange, mm -hmm. and therefore the cost of any policy in the exchange would go up. And while there's some truth to that, um, I think that they should have honored the president's commitment that if people like their policy, they could keep that policy at least until that policy expires because uh, it's never been the case that anyone could guarantee that your insurer will give you the same policy with the same premiums. Yeah, right. I've certainly never had that benefit. <laughs> um, but uh, my family and I enrolled through an exchange, and, uh, and it's going to open up a lot of health care opportunities uh, for millions of Americans that can't get coverage because uh, they, right now they couldn't afford it or couldn't get coverage because they had a pre-existing condition. Um, but, you know, we're going to have to get through this transition period mm -hmm. uh, like you do with any major reform where there are going to be challenges. And we've seen some of them, we'll see others. Growing pains abound, but I'm yes. sure it, it will happen. We're going to have to take another break. Uh, please uh, stay with us. Welcome back. We're continuing our conversation with Representative Adam Schiff. And I want to shift once again to some uh, national issues and priorities. Uh, when we spoke last, we also talked about uh, the issue of U.S. aid to Armenia and Nagorno-Karabakh. You were certainly very vocal last year in urging Congress to double that aid to uh, Rarapar. What is going on in that process uh, right now? Well, we just finished a, an omnibus appropriations bill for the fiscal year that we're in the middle of. Uh, and we did that because we were not able to get to an agreement on it uh, in the regular course of business. Uh, that omnibus spending bill um, uses a practice that the administration has started employing over the last couple of years where it doesn't specify country level funding. Um, traditionally, we've uh, fought for a certain level of funding for Armenia and the lobby for Azerbaijan has fought for a certain amount for Azerbaijan and we want to make sure that we got at least as much if not more than Azerbaijan uh, and, uh, and that we got a specific amount for Nagorno-Karabakh. They've done away with that uh, approach uh, because I think, uh, as a practical matter, they're making cuts to foreign assistance across the board. Mm -hmm. And if they don't identify what the amounts are for specific countries, it's hard to point to which countries are being cut. Um, so what we're going to have to do is now that the appropriations bill uh, overall levels are set, we're going to have to fight to make sure that Armenia gets uh, a commensurate share of support. Um, Similarly for Nagorno-Karabakh, uh, we did get language in the bill that talks about the importance of meeting the humanitarian needs there and the concerns we have that funds that have been allocated there have not always been spent the way Congress intended or spent at all. Um, but uh, we're going to have to stay after it. I've met with the head of USAID, 
uh, to press home the importance of uh, utilizing those resources. He's committed to doing that. In fact, he got some flack from the Azari lobby uh, for his commitments along those lines. But um, one other initiative that, that I'm working on also, it's not a specific appropriation issue, but there are a lot of landmines that are still in the region, and they're in zones that uh, some of these NGOs are not permitted to do demining operations. Um, well, that, uh, that's a real problem because, you know, young kids in these areas walk out into these fields and they don't know that there's an invisible line mm -hmm. in the ground mm -hmm. uh, between contested areas and non-contested areas and, uh, and they get themselves blown up. Uh, and I'd like to see us overcome this, uh, this terrible um, predicament where we have the resources to do demining, uh, we're not doing it the way we should, and we're having a lot of people needlessly injured or killed. Mm -hmm. Actually, in conversations with the Halo Trust, they, you know, I've always asked them that isn't the appropriation toward Harappa going to that thing, and they've always kind of given me some kind of a half answer. Is that the organization that you'll be working with in that demining process? Uh, that's certainly one of them, and um, that is the. The issue is making sure that uh, that these funds and these operations can go on wherever the landmines are, um, and uh, because there's simply no way to prevent people from wandering mm -hmm. into those areas. Um, and you know, this should have been a problem of a century ago, but it's a problem that's still very much with us. And uh, and imagine how uh, petrifying it would be as a parent to know that. Your kids uh, have to be careful where they go, and there's no way to really tell. Mm -hmm. uh, and the agony of those that uh, have their, their kids injured. I mean, uh, the last time I was in Nagorno-Karabakh, uh, although it's been so long since the war, but people were still warning me that you need to be careful of <laughs> that area because there are still mines. So hopefully that project would uh, go forward. As far as the aid to Gharapal, you said some of it has not been spent or has not been allocated. What happens to that? Does it roll over to the next uh, phase or does it just get uh, you know, uh, ignored? Well, uh, you know, thus far, unfortunately, the State Department has ignored it. Uh, we put in language saying that, uh, initially we put up language saying that they could spend up to five million uh, or up to three million or whatever the number was. And then we would find that uh, they didn't feel required to spend up to that amount, uh, which is a rare problem to have. You usually say up to that and they go right up to that. Uh, so then we fought for language that said that they would spend a minimum of, of that amount. Um, and. Uh, uh, that I think we succeeded in getting in the initial House draft. Um, when uh, uh, the Azeris uh, had the reaction they did to the Safarov case, uh, and we uh, protested this and called for um, cancellation of any funding for Azerbaijan, uh, the Azeris lobbied uh, to have the language on Nagorno-Karabakh taken out as a uh, kind of a tit for tat. Mm -hmm. um, so unfortunately, these are the nature of the legislative fights we have over this. But uh, when the State Department USAID doesn't use that money, uh, it generally reverts back and is not available the following year. Mm -hmm. And uh, how can we get uh, some kind of a, a detailed accounting of what this aid is spent on? There are various NGOs in Armenia operating that have uh, you know, access to uh, some kind of grants. How do we, how are we able to uh, get that, you know, kind of transparency, mm -hmm. I guess? Well, uh, that's information we can request to the State Department and USAID. We've also utilized the Congressional Research Service uh, to document over time of the amounts that were authorized by our committee to be expended in Nagorno-Karabakh. How much have they actually used? Mm -hmm. uh, over the years. Uh, so we, we asked the research service to do that. They did provide us a report. Uh, that report helped us make the case uh, that you know we should put in language requiring a minimum of expenditures because plainly there's now historical pattern uh, of ignoring uh, what the Congress has requested. Mm -hmm. Uh, the other area of interest uh, is obviously immediately north of Armenia, the southern Tr Georgian Javakh region, which is uh, populated by Armenians. I believe there is a uh, move to also uh, have some kind of U.S. funding for specifically for that region. Any updates on that? Yes. Uh, um, 
I began by meeting with the president of Georgia to discuss this, and uh, at that time, it's a new president now, uh, the president was very amenable to uh, putting that focus on some of those regions, uh, not only because of their Armenian enclaves, but also because many of them have some of the greatest need uh, in Georgia. Um, I then met uh, with uh, uh, Rajiv Shah, the director of AID, to talk about this and to make sure it was a priority. Uh, we worked on language uh, for the foreign operations bill uh, that initially, again, we had in the House uh, draft, uh, putting that priority on funding there. Um, and, you know, we've had some interesting discussions about it. Uh, one of the challenges that was raised with us about having the uh, Shabak specific language is that if we do that, there are other groups that are going to want specific language for other parts of Georgia. Uh, or it may create an internal dynamic in Georgia where what they want to do in the aid they already want to provide there, uh, they have a problem in doing. Mm -hmm. So obviously we want to do things that are going to be pr productive, not counterproductive, but uh, we have communicated to all the parties working on this that this is a priority area. It's a, an area with great need uh, and we expect them to pay attention to it. Um, I want to quickly touch on Syria. We're speaking, uh, you and I, right now as a, a peace conference is unfolding in uh, Geneva and the humanitarian toll that this crisis has brought is just uh, incredible. Um, I just want you to ad address that issue. You've gone on record about, uh, in fact, in our newspaper, about the need to uh, uh, look at the Christian minorities. Uh, what can you say about Syria? Well, uh, it's a, just an appalling situation. Uh, the, the loss of life has been devastating. Uh, over 120, 130,000 people killed. Uh, the atrocities now being committed on both sides are just uh, ghastly. Uh, you have the government dropping barrel bombs loaded with shrapnel uh, into um, heavily populated neighborhoods in Aleppo. Uh, you have some of the Islamist rebel factions, some allied with Al-Qaeda, beheading people, uh, tying people up and uh, shooting them in mass executions, uh, kidnapping people, uh, forcing Christians to convert to Islam. I mean, it's just an appalling humanitarian disaster. Um, and one of the things that I've been leading for uh, the last year is an effort to try to grant humanitarian parole to many thousands of Syrians predominantly Syrian Christians who have family in the United States. They have approved immigration, family-based immigration petitions, but because of the cap on visas, uh, they have to sit and wait. Sitting and waiting in Syria right now is not a very uh, attractive option because uh, your life is very much in jeopardy, particularly if you're a member of a minority. Um, and you know this uh, really um, historic Christian community is at, at uh, devastating risk right now. Um, and not only do I think we need to grant this humanitarian parole, and I now have 70 of my colleagues who have joined me in this effort. It's a very bipartisan effort. Uh, I met recently with the Deputy Secretary of Homeland Security to press the case. Been having conversations with the National Security Council to press the case. Um, but we also need to make sure that at the conference going on in Geneva and any future conference, that uh, whatever um, uh, successor government there is uh, in Syria, uh, protects the rights of its minority uh, population. Um, and uh, it's just absolutely devastating. And, but I can tell you that uh, uh, no one has done more on this issue in terms of the Christian and minority communities there or started earlier on this problem than I have. Uh, and I think we built a pretty good coalition in Congress and we're trying to raise a lot of awareness on this. Senator Durbin uh, recently held a hearing in the Senate to focus on trying to provide re relief through the refugee program, which is another avenue that we can help. Um, the one thing that we are doing uh, quite considerably is providing financial help. But uh, I think probably the most important thing uh, in addition to that is you know, providing direct assistance by allowing these families to come and be reunited with their families in the United States uh, and pressing the case in these international negotiations for the imperative 
of protecting those minority communities. Mm -hmm. um, I guess this issue percolated at that you know instance, the two weeks in, in uh, or a month in over the summer, where there was issues of uh, attacking Syria uh, by the U.S. and there was that deal with uh, Russia. I think the sensitivities of the community here, especially, um, lean more toward. Uh, the identification, and it's been happening recently on the front pages of the New York Times and the Washington Post, that exactly who these rebels are. We reported last week that there are Azeri mercenaries that are fighting among the uh, Islamists. So uh, I think there, this issue of uh, addressing the minorities issue should come also from that perspective. What are your thoughts? Well, unfortunately in Syria, um what started out as a more secular uh, uh, protest movement, uh, like much of the Arab Spring began, mm -hmm. uh, has been hijacked by a lot of uh, uh, radical Islamist factions. Um, what Assad threatened in the beginning uh, when he cracked down on these protests um, became a self-fulfilling prophecy. Uh, the Times said, it's me or the Islamists. Now we hear this a lot from uh, authoritarian regimes in the region. We heard this from Mubarak, uh, it's me or the Islamists. Um, and because they deny any secular opposition, um, they have de facto created that situation. And in Egypt, you, all you had was a choice between the Muslim Brotherhood and the military. When the people who were at the vanguard of the revolution in Egypt didn't want either. Uh, they didn't want a mili military dictatorship and they didn't want a Islamic dictatorship. Um, and, but unfortunately, the uh, conflict in, in Syria has just spiraled completely out of control. And now, some of the most numerous uh, uh, fighting forces in opposition to the regime are, in fact, the jihadis. Uh, and they have been flocking to Syria. Um, many of them are not Syrians. They're not indigenous to the, that part of the country, but they're, uh, or that country, but they're flocking much as people flocked to Afghanistan to fight the Soviets. Um, and this is going to create a real danger and risk for, for us, for Europe, uh, as people who are trained in bomb making and in terrorism, uh, when that conflict ends or even before it ends, uh, come back to the United States or go to Europe uh, and are encouraged to commit acts of terror there. So uh, it's a horrible uh, problem. I, you know, I think we have to be really uh, open-eyed about this. Um, and uh, recognize that you know neither side, there's no good side anymore in this conflict, if there ever was. Uh, there are atrocities being committed by the regime and there are atrocities being committed by the opposition. Um, and uh, it, yeah, I, w I wish I could see the clear path. Um, probably in Geneva, a success would be very modest and consist of ceasefires in certain areas an end to the siege of certain areas where people are starving, uh, the availability of, to bring through quarters of medical supplies and food, uh, and uh, using that as a basis to take a pause in the violence, uh, and then uh, entering into a discussion of what a transition government uh, respectful of the minorities in Syria would look like. Mm -hmm. uh, that is probably the optimal course. Um, as a practical matter, uh, it will be hard to make progress on that goal until both sides realize that they're not going to win militarily. Um, and uh, you know, I think the opposition is getting the sense they're not going to displace the regime militarily, and the regime will ultimately get the sense that they're not going to be able to eliminate uh, the violent opposition, uh, and hopefully we can have a pause in the violence such that um, both sides can agree to a transition government uh, and a better future and a safer future for the people living there. Yeah, I guess all of our eyes on, are on Geneva. Uh, quickly, let's move up to uh, Turkey because we've seen um, the Post, uh, the Washington Post, the New York Times, calling on the Obama administration to curb its uh, you know, open-armed support of Turkey, especially given the violations of human rights, press, and now this new scandal, the graft scandal that has erupted in Turkey. Uh, from an Armenian perspective, uh, this also goes hand in hand with the addressing of the issue of the Armenian genocide within Turkey. So how do you view this issue playing out? Well, I think a lot of the turmoil that is, uh racking Turkey right now is part and parcel 
uh, of the same phenomenon uh, related to genocide denial. Um, what we saw even before the protests in Istanbul, which got things started there uh, over plans to develop uh, or, or uh, demolish a park and build you know, condominiums or whatever they were going to build there. Which incidentally um, was on an Armenian cemetery. But is, <laughs> uh, um, is, you know, even before that we saw increasing authoritarianism on the part of uh, Erdogan's uh, government. Um, we saw increasing repression of Turkish journalists. Um, and of course we had seen that for years in the repression of anyone, journalist, activist, author, uh, or ordinary citizen who had the guts to talk about the genocide. Uh, they brought up uh, their Nobel Prize winning author, probably the most famous Turkish author in recent memory, uh, on charges for mentioning the genocide. And, uh, and of course we know what happened to Hurant Dink, uh, one of the publishers of one of the main newspapers in the Armenian community, someone I had the, the pleasure of meeting years ago and, uh, and who I was greatly impressed with. Uh, so what's happening now um, with the corruption scandal, with the further crackdown, uh, is all interrelated. Um, where you don't have a free press, uh, and Turkey's becoming one of the leading uh, prisons for journalists, you're going to have corruption flourish because there's no one to shed a light on what's going on. And I don't know where this is heading. I don't think anyone knows where this is heading. It's interesting the Turkish government response has been to blame us. Uh, to say that we are somehow in cahoots uh, with a, um, uh, an imam who lives in the United States, uh, an exile from Turkey. Uh, it's kind of a preposterous theory, but uh, shows a bit of the desperation of the, uh, the Erdogan administration. Uh, and why you know, we would want to give un an equivocal support to a government like that, I, I don't know. Um, but I certainly know that um, this policy or absence of a policy that has permitted Turkey to deny the genocide uh, has not served us well and I think it, it really contributes the kind of behavior we see uh, because if we're not willing to speak honestly with Turkey about the genocide why on earth should they speak honestly about it uh, and uh, and that that policy has just got to change. Mm -hmm. Uh, very quickly, uh, before we close, I want to talk about your uh, new district. Uh, it, it, it seems like yesterday, though, <laughs> that the elections happened, and you have one uh, coming up uh, this year. Uh, what, have, what have you learned in, in your new district? How is it different from your previous experience? Well, uh, you know, I feel very fortunate. Uh, the new district is a wonderfully interesting, diverse district goes all the way from West Pasadena to West Hollywood. Uh, it has a lot of the areas that I had uh, in the last district. It has a lot of the areas that I had 10 years ago before the last district, uh, redistricting, like Silver Lake and Las Feliz and Atwater Village. It has some new areas like uh, Echo Park and Hollywood itself and Hollywood Hills and West Hollywood. Uh, it's really just been a treat um, to get to know the communities and the homeowner organizations and stakeholder groups, and uh, um, it's very invigorating. Uh, it's sad, in a way, to lose the communities that you've had for a long time, and some of those communities I represented for 16 years, mm -hmm. but uh, I was very lucky in the new communities that uh, were uh, redistricted into this district. Uh, it's a wonderful challenge, and, and I didn't think it was possible, but uh, the Armenian community in the new district is even larger than in my old <laughs> district, uh, and that's quite wonderful. Well, we'll, uh, we'll check back in with you in a, a couple of months and see uh, how it's going. Thank you so much for taking the time out to come out to our studio. It's a pleasure. And thank you all at home for uh, watching. See you next time.